Okay, uh, <clears throat> this is Plug Iron, and uh, we're ready to go here um, <clears throat> with this webinar, an introduction to anti-terrorism standards for design of buildings. <clears throat> um, to kind of clarify a couple um, or make a couple of points uh, right up front. The thing that will uh, be of most value to you here is some of the tables and figures that you will see later on. And uh, in order to get any use out of those, you need to get copies of them. And I believe you can get copies of these PowerPoints uh, by going to your um, uh, website and your account, logging in and following the instruction should be uh, uh, able to uh, download or in some way get a copy of these PowerPoints. Now, um, to kind of explain where uh, I will be going with this discussion, anti-terrorism, uh, this is uh, focusing on the uh, explosives, uh, the bombs, that primarily. This is not uh, intended to address the issue of uh, uh, the random shooters that, uh, you know, they're uh, very difficult to defend against because they can... Uh, get into all sorts of places where uh, people are um, congregated. And the, um, uh, <clears throat> these anti-terrorism measures that I'll be uh, chatting about today are um, intended to hopefully protect the people in the buildings. Um, and uh, not to prevent the building from collapsing. Uh, the, um, there's kind of another <clears throat> approach uh, as far as uh, avoiding uh, or trying to avoid having the building collapse in the event of an explosion or a big earthquake or something like that. And uh, that uh, <clears throat> is focused on uh, the structural design of the building and uh, incorporating structural features that will uh, hopefully avoid collapse of a building if you uh, 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 break, if you will, a column or a beam or something like that, the building will still stand up. Uh, that's not what this discussion is about. This discussion is, is just about the uh, protecting the people. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, from time to time, uh, there may be some terminology that uh, I will be using or that is in, included on the um, PowerPoints that has kind of a militaristic uh, <clears throat> tone to it. And that quite candidly is because uh, uh, military facilities uh, are the ones that are uh, prime targets for uh, terrorists with explosive threats and this sort of thing. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's just the nature of what we're chatting about today. So here is um, what I'll be talking about, kind of the chapters in the book, uh, the basic assumptions of what the threat uh, consists of, the uh, controlled perimeters and access control. This is an important consideration. And by controlled perimeter, you can visualize this as you've got a group of buildings and uh, you uh, put a fence around these buildings. That's a controlled perimeter. So uh, people uh, cannot get into the buildings 
without going through an entry point where the, uh, their automobiles or their uh, hand luggage or whatever uh, can, be, uh, can be expected or inspected. Um, levels of protection, um, applicable explosive weights. This requires a little explanation here. Um, these standards <clears throat> make certain assumptions about the explosive weight uh, of the bomb. And this is uh, uh, <clears throat> in terms of nominally of pounds of TNT or dynamite. Uh, however, uh, nowhere in here will I be telling you what these explosive weights are, quite simply because these are defined uh, by the Department of Defense uh, and they change as terrorists uh, demonstrate that they can uh, construct more uh, dangerous uh, uh, explosives. So um, the explosive weights, um, one, two, three, one is a big bomb. Uh, basically, it's something that you would have to have an automobile to conceal it in, in the trunk or something like that. Uh, explosive weight number two is smaller explosives, something that uh, someone, an individual could bring into a building like in a suitcase, something like that. And they might uh, be able to uh, store it in a closet or in a dumpster or something like that, go away and then set it off remotely. So explosive weight number two is uh, something that could typically be into a building in a suitcase. Uh, explosive weight number three is the smaller explosives that an individual could take into a building concealed on his person or perhaps in a briefcase, something like that. So those are the, uh, uh, the three categories, one, two, three, big bomb, middle-sized bomb, uh, small bomb. And um, the concept standoff distances. This is the uh, primary defense mechanism <clears throat> is to uh, keep the uh, terrorists away from the buildings that you're trying to protect. I have a few comments on unobstructed space. Um, unobstructed space uh, has positive aspects and negative aspects. It has positive aspects in that um, unobstructed space around the buildings. The people in the building can look out the window and they can see if there's somebody climbing over the fence and running across the open space between the fence and the building. Uh, so that's a positive aspect of unobstructed space. But obstructed space also has uh, a an application, you might say, uh, because in addition to the bombs, other kinds of uh, terrorist uh, weapons, if you will, here are those that are directed, that is like a rifle. Uh, and uh, to use a rifle to attack a building, uh, the terrorist needs to have line of sight uh, to, the, uh, to the building and to individuals perhaps within the building. Uh, and if you uh, uh, obstruct the space by planting trees or berms or things like that, then they, uh, uh, the terrorist cannot use a directed weapon like a rifle or a gun or something like this. Uh, the other kinds of weapons uh, that are considered are, uh, you might think of them as like mortars where you just shoot a, a projectile up in the air and it comes down and you, uh, the terrorist hopes that it hits something, but he can't really, doesn't have line of sight to uh, uh, see what he's shooting at building occupancy levels, um, and then there are certain hazards, uh, elements in a building design, glass and doors, windows, things like that, that um, 
are a weak point and uh, typically you would want to uh, uh, address uh, in, in the design the uh, uh, having an appropriate type of glazing in the windows and the doors and things like that. Exempted building types, these are <clears throat> ones that uh, uh, in primarily in this military way of thinking about things is uh, uh, are ones that uh, uh, you don't worry about too much because they're not typically targets of uh, uh, terrorist attacks. Now, uh, game plan wise here, as far as the uh, webinar is concerned, the way we'll move forward is I, uh, let's see, Stephen says he looked on the site, no access to the PowerPoint file yet. Okay, Jim um, Paul. Uh, would you address that issue and uh, see that the uh, uh, the attendees uh, are able to uh, get copies of these PowerPoints? As a matter of fact, I'm going to type my uh, email address in the uh, chat box and uh, Okay, I've uh, typed my email address in the chat box. And so if you have any problem getting the uh, uh, PowerPoints from uh, <clears throat> uh, PDH source, you, you can email me and I'll send them to you. Okay, uh, now getting back uh, very quickly, uh, the format here is I'm bored with the discussion for 50 minutes and then we take a 10 minute break, come back to another 50 minutes, 10 minutes, keep running through that cycle. And uh, the, um, <clears throat> uh, this is just a two PDH or two hour webinar. So we'll just run through that cycle two times. Okay, uh, let's press on here. Uh, for what it's worth, this is a little bit about me and I've been doing uh, for the past few decades. In um, what I call number two, when I, uh, for 18 years, I had my own architectural engineering firm. And um, uh, the main thing we did was uh, design of military facilities. So, um, I had uh, uh, occasion time to, from time to time to have projects where uh, these kind of anti-terrorism features needed to be put into the design of the, uh, the building. I got registered in a few different things along the way. I'm basically though a mechanical engineer. That's my degree and my first registration. And uh, uh, so that's what I've been doing now. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> these are uh, these the assumptions then as far as anti-terrorism is concerned is to protect the people in the building. And uh, you're not worried about uh, damage to the building because you can't really uh, uh, do that effectively. Um, and as I indicated, uh, because terrorism threats uh, terrorism threats are largely targeted at government venues, particularly military buildings, things like this. So um, uh, you'll hear me say things that uh, uh, might be talking about uh, using some military vernacular, uh, and that's why. And uh, the baseline threats are in a simplistic way, but it's a way for you to think about it moving forward is just in terms of these uh, 
three uh, bombs, if you will, sizes of bombs, one, two, and three. One is a big bomb in like concealed in an automobile uh, uh, threat bomb two is or well number two is something that a, an individual could um, carry into a building like in uh, a suitcase or briefcase that sort of thing and then uh, the uh, third uh, type is a smaller type bomb again one that uh, a terrorist could carry into a building concealed on his person. Um, <clears throat> so those, uh, those are the threats. And as I indicated, referring to them as uh, threats one, two, and three is just the way it goes because the defining of these uh, threats uh, by the Department of Defense uh, is nominally in terms of pounds of TNT or dynamite, but these, uh, the definitions of the threats one, two, and three changes because terrorists are always uh, devising new ways to uh, <clears throat> uh, to construct their, their bombs. Now, the explosives, um, the baseline explosive weights are identified in tables B1 and D1, which you will see towards the end of this uh, discussion. And, um, and the explosive weights, as I indicated, are characterized as one, two, and three. Big bomb, medium-sized bomb, little bomb. And the, uh, uh, the definition of, of what these weights are is uh, uh, classified information uh, by the Department of Defense. Okay, um, a key concept in uh, uh, in anti-terrorism is the standoff distances for buildings uh, and the um, uh, the reason is quite simply that uh, the best way to defend against terrorists is to uh, keep them away from the buildings and so this table here B1 indicates standoff distances for uh, new and existing buildings uh, and um, so you have uh, the distance, the standoff distance to a controlled perimeter or parking and roadways without a controlled perimeter. Controlled perimeter is a fence um, and uh, where everybody who wants to enter the compound has to go through an entry point and their car may be examined there. Uh, they might personally be examined, this sort of thing. So, uh, and then the building categories that are defined for purposes of the uh, anti-terrorism considerations are uh, housing and uh, high occupancy uh, housing, like apartments, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, primary gathering buildings would be a place like an auditorium or perhaps a church uh, and uh, where you have a lot of people in a, uh, in a small space. And then the third category uh, is the, uh, uh, an inhabited building. And uh, you'll need to, uh, as I indicated, get copies of these tables to really get your, uh, get your minds wrapped around them. But the standoff distances for load-bearing walls are defined here. The minimum standoff distances, as an example, uh, are uh, for the housing 20 feet uh, applicable to weight one. That's the big car bomb. Uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, so on down through the table. Uh, and so the standoff distances are, uh, you want to have security procedures in place that will keep people who are not authorized to enter a minimum of 20 feet away from these buildings. Um, the uh, and the distances to uh, parking and roadways within a controlled perimeter because <clears throat> you can have a controlled perimeter a fence around a compound or a military base as an example and uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, within that uh, controlled perimeter uh, you have parking lots and roadways and that sort of thing. And that's just the nature of facilities, the way they have to be. And the, uh, the okay, um, this is a, a little issue that has popped up before with these um, uh, Zoom. Uh, and um, okay, uh, stick with me. I assume that you can uh, still hear me. I uh, the Zoom controls are, uh, are really not uh, very user friendly. Okay. Um, all right, we're back here. Hang on just a minute. Um, okay, so we've got the um, the baseline threats here on this uh, on this and, um, uh, and here the visible beacon shows the conventional standoff in other words you have constructed the building using conventional construction uh, techniques. Um, uh, wood studs, 16, two by four, 16 inch on center, et cetera, et cetera. Um, CMU, concrete block uh, walls, things like that. And the um, uh, controlled perimeters, uh, uh, applicable explosive weights are indicated here and uh, uh, within the controlled perimeter the applicable explosive weights are what you see and then the standoff distances for the different types of construction wood studs metal studs metal panels uh, reinforced concrete etc etc Now, um, the uh, assumptions about the baseline threat as far, first of all, the vehicle bomb, this is the big one. And for purposes of this discussion, the bomb is assumed to be a stationary vehicle bomb. These standards are not uh, <clears throat> intended to be effective with a bomb in a vehicle that is being driven by a suicide uh, uh, bomber at 60 miles an hour and he crashes through the uh, entry point at the controlled perimeter and just points the car towards the building. These uh, standards will not uh, be effective against that kind of a threat. These standards are uh, intended to be effective uh, against stationary vehicles where the, the vehicle is parked with a bomb in it, the terrorist uh, runs away and sets the bomb off uh, remotely somehow. <coughs> um, 
uh, another uh, threat that is considered in these um, standards is waterborne vessel bombs. They're uh, considered basically in the same category as automobile or vehicle bombs. And um, they are uh, assumed to contain quantities of explosives associated with either weights one or two, big bomb, middle size bomb. Um, and then the place bombs, these are the hand carried ones. Uh, these would typically be the explosive weight three. They're carried by an individual into a building um, and uh, it could be a suicide bomber or it could be a bomber who uh, carries an explosive weight three bomb into a building and conceals it, runs away and uh, detonates the bomb remotely. Uh, mail bombs are under category. Generally speaking, they are uh, of explosive weights three. They're, they're small. Uh, they are uh, probably, in a lot of cases, they're uh, targeted at individuals. In other words, the, the package is addressed to uh, John Doe. And when John Doe opens the package, it, it explodes. The indirect fire weapons, again, the baseline threat that these uh, standards are intended to ad address is indirect fire weapons. These are like mortars where you uh, just shoot a mortar shell up into the air and it falls back to earth and uh, you don't have any, uh, uh, or the terrorists have the really effective way to target the indirect fire weapon. The direct fire weapons uh, are things like uh, a gun, a rifle, a rocket propelled grenade. And here the, um, uh, the defense, uh, the approach to uh, <clears throat> dealing with these direct fire weapons is not to maintain a minimum standoff distance to keep the uh, uh, terrorist uh, far enough away that the uh, rifle or uh, rocket propelled grenade uh, will not reach the building because that's not practicable. So uh, a primary defense mechanism for direct fire weapons is to obscure the building uh, so that the terrorist cannot see the building. And this, it might be done with landscaping, with trees, uh, or it might be by the construction of berms uh, of, uh, of a certain height. And uh, so that's the, that's the approach to uh, defense against direct fire weapons. Uh, chemical, biological, and radiological weapons. Uh, this is, uh, is uh, a, a difficult threat to defend against uh, because they, uh, the weapon, if you will, uh, can often be quite small and can be uh, secretly uh, carried into the building that you're trying to protect released and um, then you've got the, uh, uh, the threat of these chemical, biological and, and radiological hazards. And um, these are not going to be defended against, they're practically defended against by these standards that we're talking about here. So the standards we're talking about here are primarily explosives and then direct and indirect fire weapons. Uh, and uh, the strategy is to uh, keep the terrorist away from the, uh, away from the building, the target. Now the controlled perimeters, again, this is uh, an important part of the uh, of the strategy 
it, um, uh, it and in simplistic terms, uh, it's a fence that you build around the uh, uh, the protected buildings, and uh, uh, no one can enter uh, the uh, controlled perimeter without going through a. Uh, uh, oh, Stephen asked, "What are these standards?" UFC. Okay, these are unified facilities criteria. These are government produced. Uh, publications, uh, very, very good technical guidance, detailed technical guidance, right? And uh, you get them, uh, as Stephen points out, uh, at the, uh, the, the best uh, internet portal for, to get them is the whole building design guide, wbdg.org. Uh, and uh, this website, you go there, it's um, uh, not real user friendly. It's kind of uh, uh, complex, kind of suffers from an overload of information, uh, a too much information kind of uh, 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 place. But if you're persistent, you can find what you're looking for. So the uh, uh, the way to find, as an example, the best way to find UFC 4-010-01, etc., is you, you can actually Google that, um, and uh, there's a fair possibility that you'll actually get a, uh, a link uh, directly to that uh, publication, and it's probably going to be through the whole building design guide internet portal. But uh, the, uh, uh, anyway, uh, these, these UFCs, these are government produced, primarily produced by the Department of Defense. And they're very good uh, technical guidance uh, on all sorts of uh, aspects of uh, building design, not just uh, building and facilities design, not just military facilities. Um, so uh, getting back here to the controlled perimeter and access control. <clears throat> so the concept here is that you construct a fence around the compound of buildings and you uh, can have and you, and you have controlled access points. So anybody that wants to enter has to enter through a controlled access point. They may be able to enter for practical reasons in an automobile, or they it might be that they can only enter on foot. And the point is that you have security uh, people to uh, uh, search the vehicle, search the people. Uh, and uh, if, if for practical reasons you need to allow vehicles within the controlled perimeter, uh, then uh, there are techniques for controlling the vehicles. You're primarily uh, uh, to a degree focused on the terrorist who is driving 60 miles an hour uh, with a bomb in the vehicle and he crashes through the, uh, uh, the vehicle entry point and proceeds on to, uh, in a, uh, uh, you know, a suicide type of a behavior uh, into the building and, and set the bomb off. There are, there are vehicle barriers that you can um, construct that can guard against that kind of threat, these zigzag uh, pathways uh, the, um, uh, so that a, a terrorist cannot just boom, drive through uh, at a high speed and get into the, uh, into the facility, into the installation. And there, there are other uh, vehicle barriers. And we're not talking about those uh, details. Uh, here in this discussion. So now the controlled perimeter again is that's the fence. Um, it doesn't have to be a fence. 
It could be a lot of different things. It could be a moat, could be a berm, um, and um, uh, but that's an important element uh, in protecting the facilities. Parking and roadways, um, the point here is that from a security standpoint, you would like to be able to keep vehicles um, out of the protected installation. So uh, you can't drive on, you can't park uh, within the controlled perimeter, but for practical reasons, uh, often that uh, ju just can't be done. And so the, uh, uh, there typically you uh, are often are going to have uh, roadways and parking facilities, parking lots inside the controlled perimeter. And they are uh, uh, therefore you need to keep those uh, parking lots and those roadways far enough away from the buildings that you are undertaking to protect so that you've got an adequate standoff distance. And again, these standoff distances are shown in some of these later tables uh, here in these PowerPoints. Uh, <clears throat> another uh, issue is uh, authorized vehicle parking. This, this would be like uh, uh, fire trucks uh, or, uh, or local police vehicles, things like that. So uh, inside a controlled perimeter, you have to have a mechanism for identifying authorized vehicles quickly and probably uh, allowing them access safely, quickly, uh, because they often are a, an emergency type of vehicle, a fire engine, police car, things like that. Um, emergency command and operational support vehicles. These, these are other vehicles that have to get inside the controlled perimeter, like maintenance people uh, and uh, things like that. So there has to be uh, a, a uh, the security uh, staff, uh, the guards at the installation have to be able to identify these kinds of vehicles and allow them access in an appropriate manner. Uh, and of course, they, the security uh, staff, the guards have to be uh, aware that terrorists can uh, disguise themselves as uh, um, repairmen or things like that. So, um, now the, the, um, uh, the applicable explosive weights here, uh, I've already pretty much uh, touched on this. And in a simplistic way, they're just defined as explosive weights one, two, and three. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, with the larger explosive weights, uh, typically in a uh, uh, car, a vehicle, a truck, uh, uh, there are, and there may be no controlled perimeter at this facility that you're talking about, no fence around it. And if that case, in that case, you just have to deal with that. And what you uh, have to do is place the, uh, the parking lots uh, further away uh, from the buildings and uh, then perhaps require uh, that the individuals on foot uh, pass through a, a control point. And um, the um, explosive weight two of this has to do with the, this has to do with the fact you need to pay a uh, particular attention uh, to doors and windows in building design. And uh, 
the um, uh, in the design of the doors and windows, the uh, maximum uh, explosive weight that is is considered is uh, weight two, um, and uh, so that that's just a, a practical uh, uh, consideration, and. Um, the uh, if the buildings are closer than 200 feet to the controlled perimeter to the fence, uh, both explosive weights one and two need to be analyzed as far as the doors and windows are concerned. And the um, the the windows and glass doors, that sort of thing. Uh, generally speaking, uh, what you will be doing is specifying a, a glazing system that has a polycarbonate uh, layer in it uh, because uh, the, uh, the polycarbonate, uh, basically what it does is it prevents the glass from powdering and uh, becoming shrapnel. Uh, yes, the polycarbonate does fracture, but it it holds together and stays inside the frame of the door or the window. Now, with doors, uh, a strategy uh, that uh, uh, is uh, uh, often uh, effective uh, is to uh, you have double doors. In other words, where uh, you, a person entering the building, uh, passes through the outer set of doors into uh, an alcove, if you will, and uh, uh, then proceeds through a second set of doors into the interior of the building. So if you have an explosion, of uh, weights one or two outside the building, that first set of doors will uh, shatter, uh, but it will, uh, the force of the explosion is reduced before it uh, reaches the second set of doors. Um, and uh, that's a technique that you can apply with doors. Okay, um, now here is a table that uh, uh, you may find useful in, uh, uh, in your design as you move forward. And we're not going to go through this uh, thing, uh, this table in, in detail, but it's, it's uh, uh, a tool that you can use. Uh, and it relates the level of protection uh, that you're designing for, ranging from very low to high, and the uh, associated with each of those levels are of protection uh, are the uh, potential building damage performance uh, that would result uh, with, uh, as an example, very low you're designing for a very low level of protection. Therefore, the potential building damage would be heavy damage, onset of structural collapse, uh, and progressive collapse. Now, uh, again, the as far as the building collapsing, the key there um, is the uh, approach of pro uh, progressive collapse of buildings. In other words, um, if you have a building and it's got columns and beams and decks and this sort of thing, if you uh, uh, break, say, a column with a bomb uh, and uh, the building, will the building uh, not collapse? Is there enough structural integrity left that uh, the building will stand up and the people will be able to get out. Uh, pro and progressive collapse design is uh, an entirely different topic and it, it uh, gets into uh, 
significantly complex structural design issues. Uh, associated with each of these levels of protection are the door and glazing hazards. Uh, uh, low level of protection, glazing will fracture, potentially coming out of the frame, but at a reduced velocity. Uh, door is not present, D door, or pardon me, uh, the uh, reduced velocity of the fractured glass does not uh, present a significant injury hazard, and so on and so forth. And um, then the potential injuries uh, associated with each level of performance. And um, uh, the level of protection that uh, uh, you decide to provide is based on the occupancy. Does this building, is this building going to have uh, a lot of people in it? Uh, and in a confined space like a, a, an auditorium or a church or something like that. Uh, if so, you would probably want to uh, provide a medium or high level of protection. And then the, uh, uh, in this table, the potential injuries associated with each of these levels of protection is so also indicated. So this is a tool uh, for you to, uh, that you can use. Now the standoff distances, this is uh, the primary uh, uh, tool that you have uh, work with uh, in uh, uh, addressing the terrorist attacks. In other words, quite simply keeping the terrorists away from the buildings. And uh, the conventional construction standoff distances uh, as the uh, technology exists today are indicated in tables B1, B2, and D1, which um, you will see later on. They're part of this package of uh, um, PowerPoints. And uh, th those standoff distances uh, provide, are intended to provide survivable structures for a wide range of conventionally constructed buildings. And that's important uh, uh, that the, these standards apply to buildings that use conventional construction. They're not ones that are designed for, uh, to re uh, resist progressive collapse, uh, you know, and then expeditionary structures, what that means is temporary structures. In a military uh, sense, this means when you're going off uh, to uh, battle or to deal with an emergency situation, you need to put up um, uh, temporary structures. And they, by their nature, cannot have much structural integrity and they can be as, as uh, flimsy as tents in wood framed buildings. Here in uh, table, uh, uh, this table uh, two two are the standoff distances <clears throat> uh, for expeditionary structures uh, for different levels of protection. And again, uh, the level of protection you're providing is a judgment <clears throat> that you make uh, that this building uh, is gonna have a lot of people in it or it's not gonna have a lot of people in it. Uh, it's uh, uh, a, a critical building for whatever mission you're on, a communication building, this sort of thing. So you assume a level of protection for the building, ranging from very low to high. And then the, uh, this table uh, for the, uh, indicates the potential structure damage and the potential injuries. Um, uh, the uh, let's see. I'm looking at my clock here, and uh, we're here at ten minutes before the hour, so that's uh, time to take our first ten-minute break. So let's do that. Um, 
and uh, uh, let's take a 10 minute break, come back on the hour and we'll resume here. So I'll see you all in 10 minutes.
Okay, um, <clears throat> this is Paul Geyer. The um, <clears throat> now the uh, the doors and the windows uh, and uh, to a degree the the walls uh, that you construct the building out of they are uh, uh, you have to make trade offs uh, as we always do between cost and um, uh, achieving the level of protection that we would like to have. And of course, many of the buildings that we need to protect uh, are undertaking to protect from terrorist attack. They already exist, so you can't, uh, you can't do much uh, uh, as far as the design of the building is concerned. Um, However, um, uh, with the doors and windows, uh, you can uh, you frequently, at reasonable cost, retrofit buildings uh, with uh, <clears throat> uh, glazing systems that do not shatter, perhaps with uh, uh, constructing double doors and an alcove at the entrance to the building. Uh, those things can be done uh, relatively economically frequently. And uh, there is a trade-off between standoff distance and what you are probably going to may have to do as far as uh, retrofitting the, the windows and doors. And uh, generally speaking, if the standoff distance for explosive weight one, a car bomb, is less than about 80 feet, <clears throat> um, you're probably going to need to uh, give serious consideration to retrofitting the doors and windows of the, uh, of the building. <clears throat> for explosive weight number two, the uh, mid-size bomb uh, in a suitcase or something like that. Uh, the, if the trade-off, if the uh, standoff distance is less than about 30 feet, then you may need to consider uh, uh, retrofitting the, uh, the windows and doors, perhaps. Um, so the, um, uh, the wall and roof types that are shown in table two, three, which you will see later on. Uh, and they were the wall and roof types that were analyzed uh, in, in putting this uh, presentation together to establish the conventional construction standoff distances uh, shown in tables B1 and B2, which are contained in these PowerPoints. Um, now, roofs, uh, generally speaking, uh, are not uh, going to be controlling the design of the buildings for anti-terrorism purposes, simply because terrorists don't typically uh, blast their way through the roof of a building. Uh, they come through the doors uh, and the windows, things like that. And um, the standoff distances that are shown in table two, three, which you will see later, uh, can be considered to meet the performance requirements of these standards uh, tabulated at the bottom of B2. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, commentary here as I'm going through this about tables and figures and things like that. And you're just going to have to uh, uh, work your way through these PowerPoints uh, to really grasp uh, uh, the gist of, of what I'm talking about here. But essentially, the, the big concept is standoff distances. Keep the terrorist away from the building 
that you're uh, protecting. And if you think that the terrorist uh, may have an explosive weight one, uh, a car bomb, then the standoff distance to keep that car away needs to be greater. And these are operational things that uh, your security people need to uh, address. Um, now here are the um, <clears throat> uh, conventional construction uh, parameters uh, and uh, that were used in this analysis. And you can review them at your leisure. And this is continuing with other wall and roof types, reinforced masonry, concrete roofs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you'll even stand off distances uh, based on the uh, uh, structural analysis, considering the applicable explosive weights indicated in table B1. Uh, the minimum standoff distances represent the distances at which the flexural behavior assumptions of conventional structural design are no longer applicable. At those distances, buildings have to be designed as hardened structures considering breaching behavior. In other words, essentially they are designed to resist progressive collapse. Progressive collapse meaning you assume, and in progressive collapse analysis, you assume that a given column will be removed uh, by an explosion and uh, is the structure tied together sufficiently that it will uh, stand up uh, and not collapse. Um, for existing buildings, the standoff distances less than the uh, minimum standoff distance indicated in the appropriate column of table B1 uh, will generally speaking not be allowed except where providing the minimum standoff distance is not possible. And of course, uh, frequently uh, things that you would like to do as far as terrorism protection uh, just simply can't be done in a practical way because the building already exists. Uh, and in those cases, a lesser standoff distance may be allowed where the required level of protection can be shown to be achieved through analysis or can be achieved through building hardening or other mitigating construction or retrofit, replacing the windows, uh, replacing the doors, uh, or, or constructing uh, alcove doors. Um, Now the operational options for existing buildings. Um, they, uh, with existing buildings, uh, obviously you've got what you've got and things can be impracticable uh, either for uh, uh, design and construction or uh, economic reasons. Um, now the um, standoff distances from the buildings to the entry control facilities are based on the distances to identification check areas instead of final denial barriers because these standards are predicated on the stationary vehicle bomb tactic. And the assumption is that measuring to the identification check area is sufficient because this is the furthest point at which the unauthorized vehicle can approach. In other words, uh, you've got a fence around the 
facility and you've got an entry point and a car drives up and wants to enter <coughs> the controlled perimeter within the fence. And that is the identification point, that is the security personnel check IDs and perhaps examine the car, look in the trunk, look underneath the car, this sort of thing. Beyond that is typically uh, a final denial barrier. This, this is desirable, but not always practicable uh, to, uh, to provide. In other words, uh, it, it's intended to address the terrorist in a vehicle who just blasts right through the identification check area and is intent on just driving at 60 miles an hour into the building and blowing it up. And there's a there can be a final denial barrier and these can take different forms. Uh, they can involve uh, uh, pillars, for example, that uh, are uh, uh, in the roadway that prevent uh, a vehicle from driving beyond these, uh, these defensive pillars. Uh, and then if a vehicle, after it's passed its identification check, it's uh, decided, it's concluded that it that vehicle can enter the area, then the, the pillars, the defensive pillars are dropped down by a, some kind of mechanical means and the vehicle can pass. And there, there are other uh, uh, things that can be done. You can uh, construct uh, these zigzag pathway configurations so that the vehicle, when using these, these typical highway uh, uh, barriers that we see all the time, uh, temporary barriers frequently, and you, you place them, and the vehicle can't get through this zigzag configuration without slowing down. So that allows the security personnel an opportunity to uh, uh, take control of the vehicle. Um, now the unobstructed space, um, again, this, there are pluses and minuses. Uh, the unobstructed space, if you, within a controlled perimeter, you have a building and you have a substantial unobstructed space between the building or buildings and the uh, perimeter control, the fence. Uh, this can be a good thing from a security standpoint because the uh, people in the building or the security staff uh, can see if uh, anyone is trying to cross the, this unobstructed space. So that's a positive uh, aspect of having unobstructed space between the building or buildings being protected and the perimeter control, the fence. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, with unobstructed space, you do have the issue of uh, directed fire weapons like a, uh, a grenade launcher or a rifle of some sort. Uh, and with unobstructed space, the terrorist uh, could uh, see all the way to the protected building and therefore be more effective with uh, his uh, directed fire uh, weapon. And so, um, uh, concealing uh, the building uh, can be uh, helpful in uh, protecting against directed fire weapons, uh, trees, landscaping, berms, this sort of thing. And uh, if you have uh, enough budget to uh, do these sorts of things, a combination of a <clears throat> 
visual obstruction to protect the buildings from directed fire weapons and a, uh, <clears throat> an expanse of unobstructed space that is viewable by typically security personnel uh, so that they can uh, uh, see if any terrorist is attempting to cross the uh, unobstructed space. So there are pluses and minuses with obstruction. Um, the threat upon which the unobstructed space in these standards is predicated involves the explosive weight. Uh, and the explosive weight for unobstructed space uh, that is the uh, uh, used is in this analysis is weight two, the middle size bomb. Uh, and um, the um, um, let's see, let's uh, I'm trying to uh, Steelment. Um, this is an issue uh, <clears throat> that uh, arises uh, with hand carried explosive devices. So the weights two and three, uh, a uh, an explosive that can be carried in a suitcase or briefcase or in the case of explosive weight three that a uh, terrorist can have concealed on his person. And the assumption that is made in these uh, uh, standards is that the device uh, that might be concealed will have a least dimension of six inches. And that is consistent with a briefcase or uh, small suitcase. Uh, so, uh, and the uh, in this analysis, the requirements for the unobstructed space are based on eliminating any opportunities to conceal objects of that size. Uh, and it is in these standards further assume that the aggressors will not attempt to place expo explosives where they believe they might be noticed, so they'll be concealed. Uh, the, um, the building occupancy level, uh, this defines uh, the uh, level of protection that you want to provide to that building. And the level of protection then uh, leads you to define the standoff distance that you would like and the uh, possibility that you may need to retrofit some features of the building, like windows and doors. Um, and the uh, <clears throat> buildings, other than housing uh, buildings, can be categorized uh, as either low occupancy, inhabited, or primary gathering. So those are the categories for occupancy of buildings. There aren't going to be many people in this building. Uh, the building is going to be inhabited. There are going to be quite a few people in this building. Uh, and then a primary gathering building is one with a lot of people in a uh, confined space like a, uh, an auditorium or a church, something like that. Um, if there are low occupancy portions of buildings, uh, they can be treated differently uh, from the inhabited portions. So if you've, uh, uh, you might have a building that has portions that are uh, considered to be inhabited, uh, 
or perhaps being a primary gathering building, but there can be other parts of the building that uh, are um, considered to be low occupancy and therefore those low occupancy portions of the building you may not need to uh, or find it desirable to uh, retrofit windows and doors. Um, now the uh, uh, expeditionary structures uh, these are, as I indicated, are the temporary type structures that uh, are uh, Appendix A. Let me see now. Uh, hang on just a second. Uh, appendix A. Um, I'm going to let me flip to the end and see if uh, if I included uh, the appendix A in this in these slides, and I don't think I did. So that being the case, um, send me an email at uh, the email address I put in the uh, uh, chat box a while back, and tell me you want a copy of the uh, uh, appendix A, and I'll send it to you because it is. There is a um, um, whatever you might want to call it. There is a, a monograph that goes along or parallels these slides, and uh, that's where that appendix A is. So uh, send me an email, and I'll I'll send it to you. Uh, so the expeditionary structures again. These are the one the temporary ones. Tents. Uh, Quonset huts, things like this, the ones that are erected very quickly when a typical um, military uh, body or uh, emergency responders uh, arrive uh, at a site uh, and they uh, are, uh, they don't have much structural integrity and so the, um, and generally speaking, it's not practicable to do much in the way of hardening of expeditionary structures. And so you need to rely on uh, staff distances, uh, setting up uh, uh, with your security forces a controlled perimeter. Um, Tenant buildings on installations. This is a military type of a thing where they're uh, thinking in terms of military bases. And there are tenant buildings that do get constructed on military bases. It's a McDonald's hamburger uh, place. And uh, the, uh, uh, these tenant buildings on installations Generally speaking, uh, you want to require that they comply with these standards as well, because they can be places where there can be uh, significant numbers of, of people congregate in a restaurant, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, enhanced use leases, that's just where the military or whoever it is leases the ground to a, a user. Now the getting back to the windows, uh, generally speaking uh, with glazing systems, uh, laminated glass with a polycarbonate uh, layer sandwiched in between is the uh, uh, the glazing system of choice and that's uh, another uh, glazing system that uh, might be appropriate is wired glass because uh, with wired glass the uh, the wire embedded in the glazing holds the glass in place within the frame and prevents it from becoming shrapnel. Uh, 
but the the wired glass has the drawback that it uh, uh, you can't see through it. Generally speaking, it's uh, uh, not uh, really that transparent. Um, and so the uh, laminated glass with a polycarbonate uh, layer is uh, often the best uh, practical glazes to use uh, for uh, uh, protection against explosions. Other uh, uh, kind of uh, Jury rig uh, uh, treatment uh, for windows that can be often quickly put in place is blast curtains. These are uh, heavy, uh, some kind of fabric, perhaps kind of a, a rubber and plastic uh, type of a curtain that can be constructed or installed on the inside of the windows so that uh, in the event of a blast and the glass shatters and uh, this shrapnel was a significant hazard to occupants of the building, it can, uh, uh, this, this blast curtain can prevent that shrapnel from entering the building. And so that is a uh, possible uh, solution to uh, windows, perhaps on these expeditionary structures. Now, they, uh, these blast curtains have the drawback in that they are usually uh, not transparent, so you can't see out the window. And uh, so, they uh, um, they have that drawback. Um, glazed exterior doors, door glazed exterior doors. Uh, you can utilize the same uh, laminated uh, glass and polycarbonate glazing system as you could with windows. So that can provide a. Uh, 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 level of uh, safety for the glazed doors. And then, of course, with the doors uh, constructing an alcove, uh, an in entry alcove uh, with a second set of doors, that uh, can be quite effective at uh, protecting the occupants of the building uh, in the event of a blast at the doors because the, the outer doors will. Uh, uh, fracture and shrapnel will be produced, but it uh, is um, uh, going to be restrained pretty well by the second set of doors. Um, um, Exterior stairwells and covered or enclosed walkways, uh, very difficult to uh, provide a um, level of blast protection uh, simply because they are outside the building and they may be covered walkways or enclosed walkways. If they're enclosed, uh, then uh, if they're enclosed by uh, wall construction of some sort, CMU block wall, well, then you've got a level of blast protection. But if they're, if they're glass enclosed walkways, then uh, you've got a serious uh, risk uh, of the, uh, the glass fracturing and uh, turning into shrapnel. So now uh, there are um, some buildings that these standards, and again, these standards are kind of have been developed uh, kind of to uh, guide the design of military bases. And military bases have a lot of different 
types of building on them. And in a way, they are like small towns. And some of these buildings uh, are considered to be uh, uh, less critical and therefore they are exempted uh, from these standards. Uh, and the, some of these buildings that are exempted by these standards are low occupancy, family housing, residential, the uh, uh, um, th these are typical single family homes or maybe uh, duplexes or quadplexes on a military base, low occupancy uh, housing. And uh, from an economic and practical standpoint, um, they uh, are it is considered that they will not typically be the target of terrorists. And this is, uh, uh, has been borne out by experience. The terrorists do not uh, go around uh, setting off car bombs uh, in front of uh, 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 three bedroom, two bath, uh, single family homes. They, they set off their car bombs uh, in uh, uh, buildings with higher occupancies or buildings that uh, uh, have a more critical purpose uh, as far in the minds of these terrorists. Town centers, um, small town, you know, with uh, some retail and uh, uh, buildings and things like that. Uh, these areas are considered to uh, not be a major target of terrorists, and that's been borne out by experience. They, uh, <clears throat> terrorists do not uh, drive uh, a car bomb into down the main street of a small town and blow it up in front of the um, <clears throat> a coin laundry or things like that, or a candy store. So town center, small tail establishments, not going to have a lot of human occupancy. Gas stations and car care centers, uh, garages. Um, these are exempted because by their very nature, uh, cars must be allowed uh, in them uh, because <laughs> Otherwise, they don't fulfill their purpose, um, providing gas or repair services for cars. Also, the uh, human occupancy is uh, uh, low, typically, uh, on gas stations and car care places. So they, these types of buildings are exempt from these standards. Um, also exempted are uh, what's characterized as transitional and temporary buildings. This might be like a, a construction office uh, shacks at a construction project, uh, tra construction trailers. Uh, again, they're, uh, <clears throat> they're not gonna have a lot of human occupancy. So, uh, and they, by experience, have shown experience has shown that terrorists don't um, a, attack uh, building like like construction shacks and things like that. Um, and again, the other small standalone commercial uh, operations uh, a. Uh, a McDonald's type place or something like that, uh, a mini mart. Uh, they're uh, not going to have a lot of human occupancy and therefore uh, they're typically not going to be the target of terrorist attacks. Therefore, they uh, do not need to uh, uh, usually comply with these these standards. Um, now, there's a 
this is to the training of your security personnel, the people that are working at the uh, vehicle access point where the cars and people enter the controlled perimeter. And uh, now here is uh, table B1, which has been referred to several times as we've been moving along. Uh, and the, this indicates the standoff distances for new and uh, existing buildings. Uh, standoff distance uh, to the controlled perimeter or parking in roadways without a controlled perimeter. So uh, again, the controlled perimeter, you build a fence around it, but you can't always do that. And so uh, uh, you, uh, you want to keep the parking lots and the roadways uh, as far away from the building as you can. And building categories, uh, again, the, the three ways that buildings are uh, characterized for uh, anti-terrorism measures are uh, family uh, or housing, uh, family housing uh, and uh, high occupancy uh, apartments and things like that. The second category is primary gathering buildings. Uh, again, auditoriums, churches, etc. A lot of people in a confined space. These are often the uh, target of terrorists. Um, and then inhabited buildings, that's just a building that does have people in it. It's an office building, it's a shop, it's uh, whatever. And uh, the, uh, uh, these are the three categories. And these standards uh, define the level of protection that uh, you should consider. Uh, and it's as indicated there, low, very low, et cetera. The um, uh, load bearing walls and the load bearing walls, those are, defined in the, uh, uh, in the footnotes, the type A and C. Minimum standoff distance, uh, again, still talking about uh, the distance from the building to the controlled perimeter or fence or the roadway and parking lot if you do not have a controlled perimeter. Minimum distance, 20 feet. And this is based on an explosive, these standards are based on an explosive weight of class one, big bomb, car bomb, and so on through the, uh, uh, through this table B1. Uh, here are the uh, uh, conventional construction standoff distances for uh, different types of wall construction. Um, and I don't think I, uh, yeah, I think I did uh, touch on this. Generally speaking with terrorists, you're not concerned about uh, roof construction because terrorists do not tend to attack a building through the roof. They go through the walls uh, and the doors and the windows. So, um, Considering the uh, 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 the types of wall construction and the uh, 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 controlled perimeter distances for the different types of wall construction uh, A through H, which you can review uh, at your leisure, and the uh, controlled perimeter distances based on explosive weight one, car bomb, explosive weight two, uh, suitcase bomb. They are what's shown in this table. And again, you'll need to review this stuff at your lunch. Now we get to some uh, pictures that give you a better 
uh, feel for what we're talking about here. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the conventional construction standoff distances from table B1 are what are illustrated here in the um, uh, in this in this sketch uh, of a facility with a controlled perimeter, a fence around it. But uh, in this illustration, there is parking within the control perimeter, and uh, so the. Uh, if your building uh, is uh, constructed of uh, uh, conventional construction and the uh, different types of buildings that might be there, the primary gathering buildings or housing buildings or inhabited buildings, but not primary gathering or, billet or housing, so this would be an office building or a shop, something like that. And then you have uh, a low occupancy portions of a building, a storeroom, things like that. And um, so this illustrates, uh, I think, in a better way or in a more understandable way what we're talking about here. So uh, uh, this is a controlled perimeter uh, fence around it and with parking inside the control perimeter. So the, the controlled perimeter, again, uh, there, uh, when the traffic, the cars are funneled into the access point and they are checked by security personnel, then they can proceed and they can park in the, uh, in the parking lots inside the uh, control perimeter. Now, here is an illustration uh, of an installation without a control perimeter. And so the, uh, the idea here is that uh, you need to keep the parking and the roadways uh, far enough away from the buildings that uh, they do not present a threat. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, different types of uh, the three types of, of buildings that have found inhabited primary gathering and low occupancy. Um, uh, this uh, illustration is parking and roadway control for existing buildings. Uh, with a controlled perimeter um, and uh, the uh, uh, this is intended to illustrate uh, the challenge that you have in dealing with existing buildings they're already there and uh, the uh, uh, again you this this these figures need to be used uh, together with the uh, tables that we will look at later. This is uh, an illustration for parking and roadway control for existing buildings with no controlled perimeter. Um, and uh, the no parking areas are what you see and the controlled parking areas are uh, what you see uh, in the blue. So uh, um, this is a tool. Um, for a group of buildings, uh, standoff and separation distances for groups of residential structures, uh, could be single family homes or it could be duplexes or quadplexes, something like that. And the um, application of these standards, how far you want the parking uh, and the roadways to be from these buildings and the uh, how far you want these buildings to be 
from the controlled perimeter and from trash containers. Trash containers are a significant risk uh, in terrorism uh, strategies because they're easy to for a terrorist to just walk up to throw something in and uh, persons, even security personnel, uh, observing that, uh, don't think anything about it, that the person is just throwing some trash away. But in fact, it's a, uh, uh, it's a bomb and it needs, so the trash container need to be uh, kept a minimum distance away from buildings. Um, okay, uh, let's, uh, uh, that's kind of um, the story here. Uh, the um, uh, the terrorism uh, standards for the buildings. Uh, the level of protection is based on the type of building and the types of buildings that are defined are the the primary gathering built category, auditoriums, churches, the inhabited buildings category, office buildings, shops, and the uh, generally unoccupied buildings. <clears throat> and the um, threats uh, are defined by the explosive weight uh, that you assume the terrorist has with him. And these are uh, type one, type two, and type three. Type one, car bomb. Type two, suitcase bomb. Type three, a personal uh, uh, personal bomb or, you know, something that can be concealed on the person. And then the, uh, the primary strategy uh, to employ in anti-terrorism is standoff distances to keep the potential terrorist far enough away from the buildings uh, that uh, uh, the uh, bomb that is considered to be uh, uh, assumed to be used, car bombs, case bomb, personal bomb, uh, that the terrorist is kept away from the buildings by a controlled perimeter, if possible, a fence. Uh, if, the, if you cannot employ a controlled perimeter, then you uh, want to keep the roadways and the uh, parking lots uh, away from the buildings. And of course, with existing facilities, that's uh, a uh, um, just something that is already there, and there's not a whole lot that you can do fundamentally to change that. But you may be able to uh, uh, to have some degree of control. Like as an example, if you don't have a controlled perimeter around the buildings. You might put a control perimeter around a parking lot uh, so that to uh, get into the parking lot, uh, the, um, uh, the vehicles would have to be inspected. Or there can be, if you can't put a controlled perimeter around the installation, then you might be able to put a, an identification checkpoint on the road or the street or, or the highway, stop the vehicles and inspect them before you allow them to proceed. Now here in uh, these remaining slides, uh, this is a glossary of terms uh, that we crossed in talking about terrorism uh, protection and you can review this at your leisure. Uh, and I'm flipping through these expeditiously because we're here at the end of our allotted time. Um, 
again, I'm, I'm zipping through these. Um, and that brings to the end of what we've got to talk about today. And we're at the end of our time. Um, again, as I pointed out at the start, to really get your uh, mind around this stuff, you need to get a copy of these uh, uh, PowerPoints uh, and uh, uh, go through them uh, with some focused attention on your part. With that, I hope this was more or less what you were looking for today. And it uh, kind of gives you a way of thinking about anti-terrorism uh, strategies for design or retrofitting uh, or operational considerations of buildings. With that, I'm gonna bring things to a conclusion here. Uh, thank you again, thank you very much for letting me chat with you today, and uh, uh, I just wish you all to have a nice rest of the day. So thanks a lot. Bye.